Hey everybody, welcome to the North Cascades. Tonight I'm camping with some geologists. Mike Eddy from Purdue University, Stacia Gordon from University of Nevada, Reno, Bob Miller from San Jose State, and two students of Stacia's, Lou and Alex. <laughs> thing Nick's here that adds one more person so we don't have to fight over that last Oh, I appreciate last you guys. Avocado. Oh, we yeah. That, we know who's going to eat the last bit. Any <laughs> Hoover or anything up, <laughs> young Mike Eddy. <Daddy. laughs> Grab a few tomatoes. So anyway, what do we want to do today? I guess start out at the Gold Creek Shear Zone maybe and then do the foggy do? Does that sound, does sound reasonable? I think so. You were talking about walking into the Skagit up here. Right, up Foggy Do Creek. Well, the idea, the idea down here is every, all these faults are coming together. So I should point out to you, Nick, this mm -hmm. is a... Uh, Roland uh, Tabor compiled all, well, some of this is from the USGS 15-minute quads over up Lake Chelan and then my mapping along through here and other mapping. And he compiled this into a map which never got finished because of the, uh, that was 1994, so that oh. would have been right when it was. So I'm fortunate enough to actually have a copy of this thing. Uh, not in too good a shape, but <laughs> he ran one off for me. So, anyway, we're down, we're right down in this area, it's foggy dew, um, so you can see we've got, these, this would be the Skagit Nice, so this would be the Cascades Crystalline Core, the big fault, the foggy dew fault zone that comes down, and then there's other faults, the, the Satan fault comes down like this, and then it goes into this thrust fault called the Metal River Thrust, which goes right by the, t the little town of Carlton, which is a few miles after we drive back out uh, Gold Creek here. Yeah. And so that fault comes in, and then there's other shear zones that come like this, that are going north-south, and everything comes right in, and it all comes right into the Cooper Mountain Batholith, and then we never see them on the other side. And yeah. this fault zone comes in and hits the Cooper Mountain Batholith. So that's one of our big big questions is what happens on the other side of the Cooper Mountain Basilisk because that's 49 million years old. Mike's, Mike's going to have a student work on that as part of his PhD presumably yeah. and Mike, Michael did a little bit of that as part of his PhD but um, so anyway that's that's kind of the big sort of the big thing. We've got Metal over here, Skagit, Nice, Oval Peak Pluton that we walked through yesterday, which is 65 million. Then the Cooper Mountain Batholith. And then this KJNS is the Newbie group, which is kind of a garbage basket unit for these green volcanic rocks and old stuff. Oldest part of the Southern Metal Basin. So it really hasn't been differentiated very much. <coughs> Hagaru did some work before the project got closed down, mm -hmm. but Ralph said he really wasn't in shape to, to publish it yet. So uh -huh. it, it, he said it wasn't something you could put into a map. So anyway, you've got all those things coming. 
down and then there's little scraps of stuff that is a part of Quinellia, at least that's how I would interpret it, that yep. Stacia got detrital zircons out of. So that would put that as part of the intermontane terrain. And there are, again, in the metal, there is the paleomag that suggests it has been translated. So arguably, uh, you know, three miles away from us, or maybe a few more than that, we somehow missed the 1,500 kilometer displacement fault. So. <laughs> I, so that's always been the conundrum between as well. <laughs> kind of gotta be there over, somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> it makes you feel pretty bad as a field geologist, doesn't it? So anyway, I thought that I thought the uh, what we do today because I don't know if I've ever taken Stacia to that, but we might look at one of these. Maybe not this one, which is called the Vinegar Fault. But there's other shear zones that uh, cut through uh, that we might look at today. Uh, quickly, it, or fairly quickly, the road cuts are, are really nice. Okay. And then we were going to do a hike, which would cross the Ross Lake Fault Zone, but unfortunately, the, there isn't, it's mostly alluvium. Well, Foggy Dew Creek, which is this creek right here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just drive up a couple miles Can you and then see hike anything it. where the Cooper Mountain cuts it, apparently? Yeah, I, I hiked up there. Uh, it's it's Middle Fork Ridge, I believe it's called. Is that yeah? There's Middle Fork, and it's it's forested. But I went up there with uh, Will Hopkins when when he was doing his masters, 1985, and um, yeah, the Cooper wasn't deformed there, which is what we were really looking for. So that's about where it is. It's not the greatest exposure, but it's um, it's okay on the ridge. I'm sure you could. <coughs> Uh, poke around some more and find find it better or get a better observation. So it might be worth doing to, or that interpretation is correct then you know you're deforming something that's 50 million in this zone maybe younger and it's getting chopped off by a 49.3 million year pluton. Mike has a date pretty close to where it actually gets chopped off. Do you know where that is exactly? Yeah that's from this Okay. Little body. Okay. So I guess technically, if we had something right there, that would be the. That'd be more useful. Be the, but that's still pretty close. It's not like it's where the 48 million date is, where we were. I don't know. 48 was over here. Is where we were last. Last few a few days ago. So. Uh, so Mike, you've got a new grad student that's going to work on this pluton. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess it was supposed to be my PhD project, <laughs> and uh, I decided the Golden Horn Bathlift was more interesting, but kind of feel guilty, so I'm trying to right write my wrongs. <laughs> there you go. Well, I've tried, I've tried to make him feel scientific. guilty for a long time. <laughs> oh, good, Bob. Well, we all have a place on this earth. That's good. <laughs> well, and the, so. other, the other thing we discovered was in Stacia's, uh, you know, which Stacia can do a lot of detail with her techniques and some of the scene and other stuff, and that, or actually pallets, uh, or that we had some myelinites that looked like they were deforming stuff as young as 49 point, the, the one date is something like 49.4, so it's all, so much was happening right about then. Huh. So I, I don't know, it's been kind of fun this last week with what we found, I think. Part of our proposal was thinking about when you have these periods of time where a lot of magma is coming into the crust, what happens to the structures? Um, so, like, do you increase slip on faults and shear zones, or do they get locked up? And uh, this is a, uh, a great area, I think, to do that because everything gets compressed down into time, like Bob was saying, into a couple million years. It was a big time. There's a lot going on. Yes. Yeah. Not just here, but like yeah, the Pacific this Northwest. I mean. Fifty million year magmatic event is pretty uh, very voluminous. Huh. Well, that's the same age as the Tianaway dikes down in your neck of the woods, oh, yeah. Nick. Yeah. Forty-nine. What? Forty-nine point three. Mike, you almost destroyed the map here. 
coffee flavor. Oh, that was close. That was All close. that talk about how, how valuable this map yeah. is. <laughs> it, was, it was heading straight for the map. Well, crisis averted. All the more reason to scan it. <laughs> yeah. So, Stacia, you got some zircons out of this stuff? No. Uh, I haven't done any work down in the south yet. Okay. But that's kind of the plan is we collected some samples in the Skagit, nice close to the Cooper Mountain Batholith, and, and we'll date those to try to better understand some of the deformation. Because there did seem to be some sort of shear zone running along the boundary, and so kind of linking it into that deformation and magnetism history. So you guys just collected those samples the last few days? Yeah. On the, on the yep. hike that yeah. you guys did. And we've been doing a lot of work to the north in the Skagit, kind of in this area north of Lake Chelan, and the rocks are quite different up there. And so that's part of what made it kind of interesting and mm -hmm. exciting was the differences between in the southern area to the central area to the Highway 20 area of the Skagit Nice. It's, yeah, I would argue, pretty different in all three locations. <laughs> So is the Skagit way down during some of this deformation, or is it back up at the surface? Like, that was such a... It's a very interesting important question yeah. that we don't know. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. part of the plan, too, is trying to figure out when these rocks underwent decompression. And so when they're coming up towards the surface. And that's not really known. I'm guessing it's going to be quite young in that kind of 47 age range just because we know they underwent near isothermal decompression meaning they stayed at pretty high temperatures and went yeah. from 8 to 10 kilobars to 3 to 5 kilobars and so it seems like to do that it has to happen quickly and so I'd imagine the whole core has to be cooling off at that time and all of our argon thermochronology suggests that's kind of 47, 50 to 45, I guess, which you Which you've published on before, right? That 50 to 45. A little bit. We have a couple ages from up near Highway 20, and then I guess a lot of the other argon work is a lot older. Um, but we're planning to do more argon as part of this project okay. and kind of doing transects in the north and the central part and then the southern so that we get a grasp on that north to south gradient as well as east to west across the core. I think it's fair to say, Stacia, would you agree that, I mean, I think you, I know you do agree. The southern part <laughs> is uh, just to bring up, but the southern part, there's just very little data on pressures, as you well know. And, yeah. and Highway 20, is because it's so accessible and beautiful. It's been studied a lot, but well, the maybe. southern part, and they have the right rock. Yeah, exactly. For whatever reason, Highway 20 is kind of a gold mine for the rocks that have the right mineral assemblage for thermal barometry. Mm -hmm. And it's not the case in this kind of central, in particularly in the central and then in the south. Mm. It's, they're pretty minimal garnet bearing rocks, mm -hmm. sadly. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fine grain, dark colored meta sediments for who knows what's in those until you look at it in section. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Alex is going to do her PhD, so that's that's going to well, produce all kinds of work. great information. <laughs> 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 Pressure's on you, Alex. <laughs> so you, you put this team together, is that fair to say? Are you the, the lead author on this grant? <laughs> no, I think we all sort of where were we in british columbia yeah. yeah planning a proposal to work in british columbia uh, yeah. and then we realized all of our questions kept taking us back to the north cascades uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah this was a sort of a what did you say about a truly collaborative effort I yeah think? i think that's a fair yeah. 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 yeah sometimes it'll be everybody does their own thing but you know we were out last summer and uh, Stacia and I were out even longer after you left, and so we spent a lot of time already in the field together. So, mm -hmm. which a lot of grants doesn't happen. People do their you know, one person does field work, one does this, one does yeah. that. So yeah. it makes it more fun. Mm -hmm. 
But if it goes south, Mike might put it together. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of the reason we want to do this is um, we, we, we went through an area, like Stacia said, that was really highly deformed. And so you have all the really strongly foliated orthonysis. So, you know, whatever plutons were there were really, really strained. And we kind of got out of it, so we thought we found the boundaries to the west uh, uh, where the rock still foliated, but still deformed, but not that much. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is we had it at least as far, I guess, right up in here, we had very strongly deformed rocks uh, on our backpack. So the idea is if we can walk in here, my recollection is these rocks are not they're deformed, but not that deformed. And they also may be much more, we want to see if they have less biotite, if they're really more uh, felsic than the ones we were seeing. So that I hope constrain the idea of whether this is a big shear zone. Hmm. And part of the issue is that the shear zones, well, we, we had this one schist that, that uh, we outcropped that Stacia was comparing to the rocks she studied in detail and, and on Highway 20. And they're just little scraps because they're intruded out by so many things. Oh. So that's a question. Maybe that is really, you know, getting back to what you were asking, Mike, a really big shear zone that just, it's been cut out by younger things elsewhere. But anyway, we ought to be able to establish something about the boundaries of that shear zone as it is now and whether, and also I assume we'll collect a geocron sample as well for, for, for that to, I guess Mike's student might work on to see if, and geochemistry to see how that compares with the rocks we were on last week or three or four days ago, whatever it was. At least that seems to be what I have in mind. Anybody else? So did you get, got the picture on that then pretty well? It's pretty complicated right in this area. Yeah, so the, basically in subduction zones like the Pacific Northwest today, uh, you get variations in the amount of magma that's coming into the crust. Um, and so when a lot of magma is coming into the crust, we call those flare-up events. Um, and they seem to happen periodically throughout the lifetime of a subduction zone. Uh, and so one of the questions we have is what drives those flare-up events? Um, so is it driven by processes that happen deep within the earth or within the earth's crust? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that we'll be looking at a lot of magmatic rocks, a lot of plutons, looking at their geochemistry um, and, and trying to parse that out. Do they, uh, do they seem like they're coming from melting of the crust or do they seem like they're coming from differentiation of mantle melts? Mm. Uh, so that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect is it seems like when you pump a lot of magma into thickened crusts, mm -hmm. like we had uh, here in the Pacific Northwest during the Paleocene and Eocene, uh, the crust seems to collapse. Um, so uh, I think Stacia was talking about this yesterday, but imagine putting a blowtorch under some brie cheese, right? And start heating it up, it's gonna collapse. Yeah. And so here in the Northwest, we, we know there was significant collapse in the Eocene. So uh, rock units like the Skagit Nice came from uh, one GPA, so let's call that somewhere between 30 and 40 kilometers depth. Uh, to say 0.4 GPA, uh, so that's I don't know, 10, 12-ish, uh, maybe 15-ish kilometers. Yeah. So we think that that exhumation happened really quickly, so it rocketed up, and that appears to have happened at the same time that all this magma was coming into the uh, arc, into the crust. What's the collapse thing? Collapse or 
happening at the same time as this uplift? Are you talking about this geologic elevator coming up as the collapse? Well, so that's a, a good question. So I, I envision it more as you have thick crust yeah. and then collapse, so you extend it, oh. and that's how you bring things uh, to the surface. But one of the issues here is we don't have a good handle on, uh, like say with the Skagit Nice, which structure is accommodated. Yeah. Uh, the extensional component. So the Ross Lake fault zone could certainly do uh, some of that, but it's it's a pretty steep zone. Oh. Um, oh. So, so that's one of the questions: is yeah. how what is the timing of that collapse and exhumation relative to all the magma that's coming in? Got it. Yeah. And what you did, so you did that detailed work on the Golden Horn, you say and you're hoping to get that exact same level of detail with a few of these other plutons yeah i think we'll or less, or is it, you, we'll like, canvas all as many plutons as we can in the north cascades uh within this sort of age range of interest so in our case that's uh, maybe 75 to 40 million years ago yeah. uh, but then i want my PhD student who's coming in uh, this fall to really pick apart one or two uh, in in great detail mm -hmm. like like we did with the Golden Horn a few years ago. And so the Cooper Mountain Batholith is is one that I would like for him to do uh, because as Bob said it's like all the major structures in this neck of the woods just run into it and they don't come out the other side so it's a pretty important huh. uh, pretty important plutonic body stuff that you did it feels like the thing that we landed on was this crazy exhumation story yeah which we but, still don't really understand yeah. very well <laughs> is that almost an afterthought to the story with the whole Skagit and, and Swakane and others, or is that really what, is that a current focus to try to understand exactly when this exhumation is happening? Yeah, it's definitely a part of this project too. And part of it is, you know, we know based on a lot of these metasedimentary rocks and, and the orthonases mm -hmm. that there's a lot of ductile flow happening in the mid crust of the arc and and you get that information from from those metamorphic rocks primarily i would say mm -hmm. and um and so part of it is understanding when those rocks are popping up relative to the multiple flare-up events and is it at the beginning of the eocene flare-up is it towards the end of it yeah what's causing that exhumation driving it chicken and egg type right. things which I think ultimately will be pretty hard to work out but we're hoping that maybe we can find some of these little zircon crystals that we use for the geochronology mm -hmm. associated with some of the breakdown textures that tell us that those rocks underwent this near isothermal decompression path and then we could date the timing of that path and we have a pretty good sense of when they were at these deep crustal levels. And so hopefully then we can get more information about how long they resided at depth and then when they popped up relative to all the mm. major magnetism. And tying it into that whole deformation history too. Right. So I'm oversimplifying, but you're a good team, but you all have individual focus. I can follow Mike as being kind of a Pluton person, collecting samples from Plutons, and Bob's kind of a, well, how, can you, how would you describe differences with this project with you and Bob, for instance? Bob's definitely more of a structural geologist, mm -hmm. and, and then just having worked in the Cascades for so long, he has, I think, the best sense of the overall picture of all the rock types and fabrics throughout the entire crystalline core. Yeah where I feel like I've still just seen snapshots, even though yeah. I've been working here for 15 years. And <laughs> I feel like the longer I work here, the more confused 
sometimes I get and the more I feel like it's a bunch of different puzzle pieces that are moving relative to each other. Right. Um, and and then I kind of focus more on the metamorphic rocks and, and trying to figure out their pressure, temperature, time, deformation, mm -hmm. history, and, and trying to do some more detailed geochronology of, of looking at one of the things we propose is looking at titanite crystals that have been deformed where we can map out their deformation using uh, scanning electron microscope with an electron backscatter detector, a lot of jargon, but basically allows you to look at the crystal orientation. And so we can see sometimes in a single titanite that that orientation bends going across the crystal. Oh, wow. And then we can go in and date different parts of that crystal and try to date the deformation. So we're gonna try to do some of that stuff to tie in that deformation history to the PT path and and just the overall kind of ductile flow and shear zone fabrics and trying to better constrain and put timing estimates on that. All right. Last question. So if you're, anytime I'm hearing deformation Am I tying the deformation to uh, strike slip motion? Or is there way, tons of different? Tons of different things. I mean, I think ultimately you're potentially looking at regional transpression, then okay. followed by transtension and yeah. looking at fabrics associated with that. Yeah. Um, we've been talking, we talk a lot about the Roth's like fault zone and that whole system and, and movement along those shear zones. And then you can also imagine though that when you move from a meta sediment that has a lot of mica in it to an orthonase body sitting next to it, that meta sediment's going to be a lot weaker. So if there's regional um, deformation that that meta sediment's going to take up potentially a lot more of that deformation mm. compared to the orthonases. Mm -hmm. So you get kind of different deformation, different rock types, or different fabrics, I should say, right. and different rock types because of that. And it's all trying to work out what's what. <laughs> oh and so, for God. example, where we were on this last backpack, what yeah. we saw is that within kind of the foliation plane, you'd see of orthonases and metasediments, you'd see t sinistral kinematics. And then we saw these shear zones that would cut across that foliation and all those shear zones had dextral fabrics. So then we can kind of, then the goal would be to try to figure out when the sinistral was active. We know it was earlier versus that dextral. Mm -hmm. And that's where we collected a sample where some of the dextral shear zones, there was melt being pulled into that shear zone so we collected a sample of that leukocratic material or this gray nice to try to date and that dextral kinematic deformation. So it's yeah. slowly working through all those little bits oh and God, putting yeah. together the timeline of events. So I could see in the last 15 years easily how, you know, you'd have moments where you're like, oh, I, I see how this all, and then you pull back and go, no, I, yeah. I barely understand this one little... Yeah, and that's where we spent so much time for me along Highway 20, yeah. and I feel like we have a good sense of what's happening in those medicine materi rocks. Yeah. But then, like, one thing that occurred to me is we really don't understand when the metamorphism occurred anywhere in the Ross Lake Fault Zone. And part of it is because those zircons we've dated, they don't have any metamorphic growth on them. And so that's something that Alex is going to do is try to date the garnets that are present and, and try to understand whether the metamorphism up on Elijah Ridge, which is close to Highway 20 mm -hmm. within the fault zone versus down here has the same timing mm. or if it's completely different because there's all these step over zones within the Ross Lake fault zone. So time would tell. Time would tell. <laughs> You should introduce you. So these are both your students here. Yes. So Alex in the green and... Luce. Luce. Yes. Okay. Well, and they're both just starting with you. So just starting yeah. officially 
August 1st okay. will become UNR students. Okay. Technically, they're volunteers <laughs> at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, Alex is starting a PhD and we'll be working on her PhD project up here. And Luce is starting a master's and is actually going to work on samples from Norway from a completely different project. Oh. But just wanted to invite her up to cool. get some experience and see more metamorphic rocks and nice. that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Well, you're a natural. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.